Righto. Um, so we'll quickly go through uh, where genomics is, is up to, um, the use of DNA information in the analysis. Um, but I think it's always important just to come back before we do that to think about what is it that's uh, driving rate of genetic progress within people's flocks. Um, first and foremost, uh, we need to have genetic variation. So if there's not genetic variation for a trait, you know, there's no point in selecting for it. All animals are the same, basically. So good news is for all the traits we're interested in, there's significant genetic variation. It's just a matter of us being able to identify it. So other than that, there's three things that we can manipulate to uh, alter our rate of genetic progress. So you've got selection intensity. So how many of these animals am I going to keep as replacement breeders in my breeding program? If I'm going to keep 1% of the young rams as replacement stud size, uh, or I'm going to keep 5% of them, uh, obviously if I'm only choosing 1%, I can choose animals that are much higher genetic merit, uh, genetic merit than if I was looking at the top 5 or 10%, for example. So the higher my selection intensity, the smaller that proportion I'm keeping as replacement breeders, you know, the bigger the difference between the ones I'm using to breed from and the average of the mob. Selection accuracy. So what sort of a job am I doing at identifying the best animals to breed from? The better my selection accuracy, uh, the less noise that's in the system, the faster I'm going to make genetic progress. So our uh, accuracy is directly related to the rate of progress that we can make. At the other end of the scale, we've got generation interval. So how quickly am I identifying uh, animals with good genes to bring into the flock and getting those new genes flowing through the flock? So I guess the thing we've got to think about is some of these things work in, in opposite directions. If I'm trying to push my selection intensity as high as I possibly can, obviously I don't have as many replacements uh, coming back into the flock, so I have to keep those animals for longer in the flock to keep my numbers up. So if I go too hard on selection intensity on my ewes, I need to keep ewes for more years in the flock to keep my numbers up, which means the trade-off is my generation length or generation interval is longer. So some of these things don't, don't necessarily work in, in, in the same direction. So we just need to keep that in mind when we start thinking about how does genomics apply to the different breeding programs that are, uh, um, people are running. The other thing I think to think about is how do we utilise genomic information? So we're looking at using this in addition to all of the other information that we already know about. So we're already using in the analysis, as, as we said this morning, the information we know about that animal itself, the information we know about that animal's relatives for that same trait, uh, the information we know about that animal for correlated traits, so other traits that are genetically related to the trait of interest, uh, what we know about the environmental conditions they've been run in and, and the heritability. We use all of that simultaneously to calculate our breeding values. For DNA information, we now want to be able to add the DNA information into the mix as an additional source of information to calculate a higher accuracy breeding value. So what's the aim for genomics? The aim is that we can simultaneously use all of this information, so our pedigree information, our performance measurements and our genotypes uh, seamlessly uh, to make um, informed decisions uh, um, at, at the same time. So if you think about when DNA information first started getting used in the, the cattle industry in the US, uh, you'd see sale catalogues that had their breeding values in there and then they had you know, four or five or six different DNA tests for different reasons listed there separately. How do you, when you're looking at that sale catalogue, how do you reconcile all of those things at the same time to go, this is the, the, the ram or the bull in that case that best suits what I'm, I'm looking for today. So by having all these things integrated into the one set of breeding values, you've only got that one set of figures to look at um, to help make those decisions. So where are the benefits? That depends a bit on what breed type, of what breeding sort of program you're running. 
So if you're thinking of uh, the terminal sire example, terminal sire breeders can already uh, measure growth rates, measure fat and muscle, uh, birth weight, lambing ease, those sort of things. We can already measure those things on our young rams and get breeding values back in time before they're seven months of age to make a selection decision whether we use them as uh, rams or not, sires or not, before, you know, in time to have progeny in, on the ground by the time they're 12 months of age. So the benefit isn't so much in shortening up our generation interval. Um, it will give a slightly higher accuracy of selection on some of those traits. But the real benefit is in being able to identify the genetic variation for traits that we haven't been able to measure yet. So eating quality and carcass yield traits are the obvious thing that is, is of benefit in that situation. When we're talking about uh, dual purpose or maternal breeds and merinos, um, we do have the ability obviously now to include eating quality and yield traits and so on in our selection decisions. Um, they're typically not as high priorities in, in terms of profit drivers. The benefit has, the, the potential benefit is from being able to make selection decisions a lot earlier in life for traits that we, you know, typically would have had to have waited longer, you know, uh, yearling or adult fleece weight traits, for example. So by being able to identify animals that are carrying favourable genes earlier on in life, make selection decisions earlier with reasonable accuracy, you know, we can um, potentially make faster rates of genetic progress. There's some other things that we can tie into it um, in terms of, you know, those DNA tests integrate uh, with the, the pedigree uh, tests and so on, um, allowing us to identify pole genes, uh, that sort of thing. Some of the things I was talking about before with identifying animals that might be carrying unfavourable recessive genes, for example, is something that we'll be able to look at in the future. Which breeds are they available for? To be able to do this, we need to have uh, big reference populations. Um, so we can currently do it for the breeds where we have those big reference populations available. White Suffolk's, Pole Dorsets, Border Lester's, and Merino, Pole Merino. Um, we're working on ways to be able to do uh, better across breed predictions, for example, so that we can uh, start including some of the, the smaller breeds um, and ways to go collecting though, that reference population information for those, those smaller breeds as well. But um, that's, that's a work in progress at this point in time. So what's the basic idea? The basic idea is that you've got that reference population where you are recording all of the detail for those hard to measure traits, all the traits that we're interested in, and we're taking DNA tests as well. And from that information, then a ram breeder can take a DNA test, take a blood sample from those animals, and we can make a prediction based on you know, those measurements we've taken in the reference population and the patterns that we've seen between the DNA tests and those measurements, and use that information to predict breeding values for those animals in, in that commercial um, breeder's flock. So we can predict that for any you know, animals where we have you know, sufficient information in, in, in that reference population. The accuracy of those predictions from the G DNA information uh, is dependent on how closely related those animals are to the reference population. So at this point in time, the reference population is, is the resource flock um, that MLA is funding. So we've got the resource flocks based at uh, Kirby, uh, the property up at Armadale, and uh, over at Katanning in Western Australia. That's where we're uh, collecting all this information. Uh, prior to that, it was the information nucleus flocks that um, the sheep CRC was managing. So the accuracy is dependent on how closely related your animals are to that reference population. Um, and I think that gives people a, a real incentive for, you know, when we're going out to call for nominations for sires to be used in the, the, the resource flock, I think it gives you a real incentive to, to go nominating um, sires for use there. Because if, you're, if you've got sires represented there, you know, your animals are obviously going to be related to animals in the reference, and we can you know, have higher accuracy predictions for those traits of interest. 
Um, so you can see there on that chart that um, the, the higher the, the relationship uh, to the uh, reference population across the bottom there, the higher the accuracy on those genomic breeding values. Um, if you have animals that aren't related to the reference population, so if you say a strain of merino that hasn't been particularly well represented there, um, you know, we might struggle to get over that minimum accuracy requirement to report breeding values. Um, but for, for most people, we should have a reasonable base level of accuracy. Where that's really going to apply is for, you know, smaller breeds that aren't particularly closely related. Um, something like dorpers. Uh, dorpers are genomically quite different to other breeds. Uh, they haven't been represented particularly well in the, the resource flocks at this point in time because the, the research stations didn't want dorpers on, the, on those places. So we're having to look at ways of running satellite flocks where we can collect that information and then uh, make DNA testing available to, to those breeds. Over time, we will be changing from uh, industry-run uh, resource flocks to using more breeder information as um, part of the reference population to help with the accuracy of those predictions. So over time, as you guys collect information and take genotypes on your animals as well, that will become part of that reference population that is being used in the analysis. Um, that's why we're working towards what's called a, a single step analysis at this point in time. So I probably should have changed these slides. They take just a little while to work through. But anyway, um, so there's a range of ways that traits are going to uh, need to be recorded, obviously. Some things, you know, you guys sample at home, say take a, a wool sample, send it off to a fleece, uh, fleece testing lab. That information goes back to you. You then submit it to sheep genetics. We calculate uh, breeding values, report back to you. Um, worm egg counts, another sample uh, example where the same things happened. Fleece, carcass, uh, body weights are examples where you guys just um, measure them at home, uh, send the data into, um, into us to, to analyze. At this point in time, uh, you'd be taking a DNA sample. The DNA sample goes off to a genotyping lab that sends those results directly back to us because until it's gone through the analysis, those results aren't really uh, don't have a reference point for you. They're not really relevant to anything else. You can't interpret uh, 12,000 uh, zeros and ones that come back essentially for an animal. So that information comes straight back to us, goes through the genomics analysis. We combine that with uh, the results of the standard analysis and, and report breeding values back to you. Over time, as we change to a single step analysis, there's going to be the potential for people to just take a DNA sample, the genotype comes in, goes into the analysis, and we'll be able to calculate, for animals that are related enough to the reference population, we'll be able to calculate breeding values just based on that DNA test. We're not at that stage just yet, but that's, that's something in the pipeline. Um, but you will still have people who need to be recording all of the standard traits the way we have been uh, up until now, and recording DNA tests so that we've got that reference population to work with. So at this point in time, um, as I briefly mentioned, uh, we're using the, the phenotypic information or the performance you're recording at home, the pedigree information to calculate ASBVs. We're using the genotypes or DNA tests to calculate uh, a genomic breeding value and then combining those two with what's called a blended approach to give you one set of figures back. Um, so for standard breeding, standard traits, uh, your weight, your fleece weight, fibre diameter traits, that sort of thing, that's coming back to you as an ASBV that is a blend of the normal uh, ASBV and your genomic information. There are some that are getting reported back as a single step trait where, or um, being reported back as a RBV, research breeding value, where we don't have other phenotypes or other performance measurements to blend that information with. So intramuscular fat, shear force, uh, which is a measurement of tenderness, uh, lean meat yield and so on, uh, coming back just as a single step trait. So 
Ideally, over hopefully over the, the next 12 months or so, uh, it's still in research and development, so it might take longer than that, but we will be able to go to that single step analysis where all of those sources of information are coming into the analysis in one go. We can calculate it all in the one, one analysis and deliver results back to people. And that's when we can start giving breeding values back just based on, on genotypes or DNA test information. So, as I said, at the moment, we're running a, a blended approach, but there are some traits, those single step traits, um, new traits like eating quality traits and so on, that are essentially a single step trait already. So what is currently possible is that we could currently go reporting back just that set of traits to people who aren't currently recording data and sending it into to sheep genetics. So we would like to run a, a single step genotyping project at the moment to start testing the waters. So if there are people who aren't currently sheep genetics members who are interested in those traits, uh, lean meat yield, shear force, intramuscular fat, uh, what else have we got? Dressing percentage, carcass weight, carcass fat, carcass eye muscle depth. You know, we can potentially uh, get a 12K test from those people, analyse that information and send back breeding values just for those traits to them. Um, and we could run that as a 12-month project to see how that would work in the future as we move to a full single step analysis. So I think if we you know, worked on the current sort of fee structures, um, it'd still be the, the $55 for a DNA test, um, something like the small uh, flock fee schedule where we'd charge them $9.10 per animal for the calculation of breeding values. But we, we need to, to test that system, see how it works. Um, we do know that over time that cost structure would have to change because those people need to pay their share basically of main, maintaining that reference population as well. So, uh, but you know, it's something we're interested in being able to roll out, see whether there are breeders out there that would be interested in just using that DNA test information, how the pipeline would work, and then how we value that um, to go out to industry over the next few years. Um, in any case, there's more research and development that is uh, ongoing and needing to be done at the moment for us to keep moving towards a single step analysis. Um, a lot of software development for OVIS, which is the analytical software package or engine behind the an analysis. Uh, it's going to see a huge increase in computational requirements, how long it takes to run the analysis and so on. So that's being worked on um, pretty much now. Um, how do we make use of uh, the relationship between different breeds at the genomic level within the one analysis? Uh, how to group how to use genetic groups for animals that we don't know anything else about except for a DNA test, for example. Um, so there's a whole lot of work that needs to, to be done before we can get to that full single step analysis and roll that, that out um, across the industry. Other things that um, are available at the moment, I guess everyone should probably know about um, the parentage test, um, but the CRC's uh, retailing the parentage test at um, $17 plus GST uh, at this point in time. Um, so, you know, for people who are not already doing full pedigree or if there's questions over full pedigree, you know, it's the most reliable way that we've got of identifying um, pedigree. Um, particularly if you've been using syndicates, you've got some good young, young animals coming through out of that, you want more specific information uh, about, about those animals. There are a few commercial people uh, using it for things like identifying black lambs. You know, if you've got a few black lambs coming through in the flock and you DNA test them and DNA test the sire team that you've been using, you can start working out, well, this fella is the, is the sire of those black lambs. Um, just with the way um, the black gene or agouti gene is inherited, uh, it's been very difficult to try and come up with a DNA test that identifies which animals are carrying those genes. So, the best way at this point in time is to, to use the parentage test to identify them. Righto. Um, so I've already said the, the parentage poll test, $17. The, the 12K test that we're using at the moment, the CRC is still retailing that at $50 plus GST, so $55. Um, what had previously been used, the 50K test, 
it's pretty much being used just in the R&D sort of field, in the resource flock and so on. Um, but they are looking at um, new tools in the, the R&D field, um, six or 700K tests, so looking at six or 700,000 locations on the DNA um, to try and look at, and, and full sequencing, to look at how we might be able to do uh, better across breed predictions um, for smaller breeds and so on, but also identifying better um, SNPs or locations on the DNA to look at for our standard tests to get higher accuracies on, on those predictions. Um, so as I said briefly, but a um, bit more detail, the required resources to keep going with um, uh, making Gen um, genomic breeding values available to people, first and foremost is maintaining that reference population. Um, so as I said, over time, that's going to have to change from being you know, industry-funded uh, reference populations or resource flocks out more to being run in industry in, in breeders' flocks. Um, you know, covering the costs of sampling, sample handling, database management, that sort of thing, um, but also you know, additional training and extension. Um, there's been a bit of work going on looking at, um, you know, benefit cost sort of analysis and tools for you guys to say, what am I better off doing? Spending more time and money measuring traits or using DNA tests to, to help cut down that workload and identify which animals might be the better ones. So um, ongoing work there. Um, and no doubt a whole heap of other research and development as well. Um, the question still to answer is how does that get commercialised once the, the CRC is no longer operating in that, play, uh, in that space um, and you know, what sort of businesses might want to take it over. Um, how do we value or how do we uh, cover the costs of running resource flocks um, and you know, how do people who are only using genotype data manage to pay their fair share of, of what the overall evaluation would cost? So, um, I guess the summary is that genomic tests, uh, you know, give us more information uh, to calculate breeding values. We can do it earlier in life uh, and with reasonable accuracies. Um, it requires a reference population to be maintained because the genes in the population change over time, so we've got to maintain those reference populations. Um, but I think it's important for people to just stop and think about it. where is the benefit for my breeding program, my operation, because different enterprises, there's, there's a different sort of uh, reason why it might be useful to you. So, um, but more work still required on single step analysis um, and how it's all going to be valued. So I think Will must have spoken quicker that session because I, I finished a few minutes ahead of schedule. Do we, um, do we have any, any questions? We do a, a bunch of genomic tests on rams and say they're all by one particular sire. Will that help the accuracies on the other rams in that particular group? Um, while we're running on a blended approach in the analysis, no. Once we're running on a single step analysis, if you DNA test some animals and we can identify the relationship between them and others that are in the flock, then yeah, um, because of those relationships and the fact that we you know, use information from all known relatives, yes, that will have an impact on the accuracy for, for other animals. That won't happen until we're on a, a full single step analysis. Uh, what about if you're using a particular ram that's genomics tested? Does that help the accuracy of his progeny? Again, once we're on a single step analysis, yes, it will. So blended approach has its limitations. Um, that's where we're at at the moment. You know, it, it's, um, it's been the most practical way of, of us managing to roll this technology out. But that's why we're working on a single step analysis where all of that information gets used simultaneously so that if we have got um, sires that have been used, for example, uh, we can use that information to, to calculate for um, higher accuracy information for progeny and so on than we would have had access to before now. Hamish, can you um, 
just enlarge on the SD test, the 12K test for the $50 per animal, is that correct? Yeah, so that's, um, SD what, means standard density, yeah. which is what they're calling, um, it's, it's currently uh, 12, 12 K, so 12,000 um, SNPs or locations yeah. on the DNA that we're looking at. So it's, it's still being um, uh, retailed basically by the, the sheep CRC. Uh, so they're still, um, it's pretty much break even sort of costing. So uh, if, a, if a commercial company took it over, and we're wanting to make a profit on, on you know, their, their investment, basically, I think it'd be a, a higher level than that. Okay, so what, what are you getting back? What information are you getting back? Yep, so that uh, test goes into the evaluation. It is contributing to uh, a lot of your standard breeding values will have higher accuracy because of it. So birth weight, weaning weight, post weaning weight, uh, fat and muscle depth, um, so, uh, in merino context, uh, fleece weight, fibre diameter and so on. Um, in terms of the single step traits, we've got intramuscular fat, uh, shear force, which is your measurement of tenderness, lean meat yield, dressing percentage. There's seven carcass traits that we haven't had access to before. Um, there are some other things that we're still working on, getting high enough accuracies for them to be able to be reported from the DNA information. So number of lambs weaned is one thing that we're still needing to collect more information in our reference population so we can report that, uh, and worm egg count. So there's a couple of traits that we uh, are still collecting enough information so we can make high enough accuracies on, on those predictions to, to use the DNA information for. Okay, and the other thing I want to just ask is, can you just, um, do you mind just reviewing the selection intensity? Um, you talked about how many animals do you keep for breeding. Yeah. Um, could, do you mind explaining that again briefly, yeah. please? So selection intensity is just referring to what proportion of the, the mob of animals or the flock we are retaining for breeding purposes. So, um, you know, the fewer... The smaller the percentage, the higher our selection intensity. So if I'm retaining the whole lot of them to breed from, you know, obviously there's no selection intensity there. Uh, if I'm just keeping the top one or two, I've obviously got a quite, quite a high selection intensity. Okay. Um, Thanks. So Thanks. The, the smaller the proportion, the bigger the gap between the average merit of the overall mob or population and the animals that I've actually chosen to keep as breeders. So in theory, I should be making much faster genetic progress because they're on average higher genetic merit. That depends obviously on the next step of it, which is selection accuracy. How well am I identifying which ones are actually the best ones? Thanks. Righto. How are we going? We're all good? Righto. What are we up to then, Karis? That's uh, time for another cup of coffee. There's a few people nodding off, so it won't hurt. <laughs>